The Liquid Freezer 2 from Arctic is known as one of the best AIOs you can find on the market when it comes to cooling performance, especially for Ryzen CPUs. However, if there was one area where the LF2 was behind when compared to the competition, it was definitely the aesthetics department. For users looking to add a bit of RGB spark to their system, well, that wasn't an option. Now, with the Liquid Freezer 2 RGB, that all changes. Let's discuss that in this video. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here, welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. For this video, we'll be taking a look at the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 360 RGB. I want to give a shout out to Arctic for sending me this review sample to check out. Now, even though they sent me this review sample, I'm not being paid for this review and all my opinions are mine and mine alone. With that out of the way, let's start off with the packaging. I think the way a product is shipped and its packing materials are some big things to consider. You want to be able to take a look at a product's box and know exactly what you're going to get, what kind of features you're getting, and if it seems durable enough to withstand any sort of roughness during shipping. Here Arctic is using an adequate box to ship their AIOs in. The box has a picture of the unit on the front, you have specs listed on the side, as well as some QR codes which you can scan that will take you to their site so you can obtain information such as installation manuals, an install video, and warranty information. I definitely appreciate that as I can't tell you how many products I've gone through that have so much paper wasted on install manuals etc that end up in the garbage or just recycling whereas this way i can simply just scan it on my phone and look at an electronic copy rather than have to waste paper and resources so i really like that in terms of packaging content you get the AIO unit itself, an RGB controller, some mounting hardware for both AMD and Intel sockets, and a tube of MX5 thermal paste. Let's move on to the design and the aesthetics of the AIO. The version that I have is the 360mm version, also known as a triple rad since there are three 120mm fans attached to the radiator. What I also liked was that they come pre-installed, and that's not just to save you time, but there is a pretty good reason for that which we'll talk about in just a moment. The unit itself has a very robust and sleek appearance, but also gives off a heavy duty or industrial vibe. The radiator has a matte black finish to it, and this rad here isn't your standard sized radiator. It's much thicker than 360 rads I've worked with in the past from other brands. In terms of dimensions, we're looking at 398mm in length, 38mm for its width, and 120mm in height. So you'll want to take measurements twice in your case to make sure you can fit this thing, and if you're front mounting it, you'll definitely want to take into account the length of your GP. With a thicker radiator, you get much more surface area to work with, which in theory should lead to better cooling performance. The tubing Arctic uses here is also quite thick, which adds more to its overall industrial aesthetic and does feel quite premium. They have an inner diameter of 6mm and an outer diameter of 12.4mm. Arctic claims that the user shouldn't have to worry about liquid evaporation or permeation, as their fiber reinforced EPDM tubing prevents that from happening. Though we'll have to see just how much of that is true and won't really know that until much further down the road. We're talking about 5 or 6 years of operation. The tubes are covered in this really nice nylon braiding and despite how they look they are quite flexible and easy to work with. What's also nice is they give you plenty of length. At 450 millimeters, it should allow the user to install the pump in the right orientation regardless of whether they are front or top mounting the rad. Let's move on to the fans, and as I had mentioned earlier, the fans come pre-installed onto the radiator, and the reason why Arctic has done that is because these fans are actually connected via a daisy-chained connector, and the RGB connectors are also connected this way as well. The RGB are then run through the inside of the sleeving on the tubes, and you'll notice that there is actually just one PWM cable which connects to your motherboard header, and this controls the fan speeds, the pump, and the VRM fan. This is a nice quality of life feature, and it makes it very convenient when installing the unit in your rig so you don't have to worry about all that cable management. I absolutely despise doing cable management, and when you also have RGB lighting, it can get quite messy due to all the clutter. But here, you only have to worry about two cables. On the other hand though, I can see people who might want to control the fans separately be a bit annoyed about this, but to be honest, it's not really a huge deal, and I suggest not going through the whole hassle of undoing the pre-installed daisy chained cables because the fans only have a very short cable in terms of length. I believe they're only about 40 millimeters in length, which means you'll, you'll have to get your own extensions, so it's not even worth doing. 
As for the fans themselves, they have a pretty nice design. They've got five large blades which are translucent because these are RGB fans. The original LF2 only had black fans on them. The corners of the fans also have rubber around the area where the screws are installed to reduce noise and vibrations. These are static pressure optimized fans, so they're meant for applications such as radiators where they have to move air through tight and narrow spaces like the radiator fins. The fan speeds have an operating range from 200 to 1800 RPM. They are rated for 48.8 CFM of airflow and 1.85 millimeters of H2O when it comes to static pressure. I do like the way the fans look, they seem quite sturdy and robust, and when it comes to RGB, which is this version's main selling point, they do deliver. They're very nice and bright, actually very bright. Some people might see that as a con, I personally don't, and you can customize them through your motherboard software or through the included RGB controller. What I also liked was that the RGB connector will allow you to daisy chain other RGB cables so it doesn't just hog up the one single header that might be on our motherboard as generally there aren't multiple 12 volt RGB headers available. Please note that the version that I have here is just the RGB version, it's not the addressable RGB version, however if you are interested in that ARGB version, Arctic has that available as well. Then finally we have the pump and water block and this is one of the most unique ones I've seen. It's quite wide but seems to have a relatively low profile. One thing that this pump has that you won't generally find on a lot of other AIOs in the market is the inclusion of a 40mm our VRM fan, which should help keep your VRM temps low under load. This can be useful because AIOs don't have any active way to cool those VRMs off, as there's no way for the pumps to provide airflow unlike air tower coolers. And if you have a case with poor airflow, then it'll just make things even worse. We'll talk more about its benefits when we go over the thermal results. The pump also has a square shaped copper base plate and the unit itself is rated for 800 to 2000 RPM for the pump speed and it's controlled by that single PWM connector which controls the fans. Keep in mind, and this was a little bit of a concern for me because there was no instructions or any sort of documentation included, was that how would one control the PWM signal for the pump and the fans together? I mean, are they going to be spinning at the same speed? What's going to be happening there? So Arctic mentions after I did a bit of digging online that... Uh, when you send a PWM signal of 40%, the pump spins at full speed while the fans operate at their own uh, speed. So if you end up spinning the fans at 50%, the pump's going to be going at 2000 RPM. As for installation, I'd say this was the only thing I hated about this cooler. I don't have first-hand experience with the previous revisions, and I had heard that those were terrible and Arctic had made some improvements, but even so I feel like they've got a long way to go. First, you have to take off the plastic tabs which come pre-installed on AM4 motherboards, then you have to place these four black plastic spacers or standoffs, which then allow you to install these two mounting clips onto the motherboard that are screwed into the back plate which comes with the motherboard. I would highly suggest doing this part out side of the case on a flat surface, it will make your life much easier. Doing this part when the motherboard is installed inside a case makes it tricky because there isn't really anything there to hold the socket's backplate and it made me wish I had more than two hands because it kept falling out. So you have to hold it onto the motherboard with one hand and then use the other hand to line up the screw, screw it through the clips so they're held in place. And at this moment, I was kind of pulling out my hair because I had to make multiple attempts because the plastic spacers kept falling out or the, or the clips were moving. It was, it was a nuisance. I also made a major mistake of swapping the two clips around initially, which did impact my temps pretty badly. But that was my fault because at a quick glance, they look pretty similar, but the slimmer one is supposed to be installed at the bottom, closer to the GPU side. I actually didn't even realize this, and I was so fixated on other stuff like mounting pressure, paste method, etc. So I'd reached out to Arctic, and they were actually very quick to respond and help me resolve my mistake. So if you run into any issues, you can rest assured that you'll get the help you need, so that was good. Just don't make the same mistake I did. There are also two brackets which have to be installed onto the pump unit, which will allow it to mount to the motherboard's clips. Then once you have done that, you can apply your thermal compound and install the pump, which is then held down by four thumb nuts. I wouldn't say it's terrible, just quite tedious, and they could really streamline the process. Compared to the Corsair H159 Pro XT I was previously using, the cooler simply mounted to the plastic tabs which came pre-installed on AM4 motherboards with two thumb screws and that's it. Super quick, super easy. Also, one really important thing I want to mention when it comes to this install is that there are two methods you can use to mount the cooler. The first is using the standard AM4 mounting holes, and these are recommended for Ryzen 1000 and Ryzen 2000 series CPUs as they have a single monolithic die on the substrate. 
Whereas for Ryzen 3000 and 5000 series CPUs, you want to opt to use the offset mounting holes, which align the cooler's cold plate to be in line with the CPU core chiplets, and that should help increase further in cooling performance. For, for my testing, this was the mounting method I of course opted to use. Let's move on to the thermal performance. Before we get into the results, I wanted to go over our test system and the test methodology. For our test bed here, we're using the Inwin Alice, which I've turned into this open test bench. For the CPU, we've got an AMD Ryzen 7 5800X and we're running it at stock. I don't have PBO2 or Curve Optimizer or anything like that applied. We've also got four 8GB sticks of Patriot Viper Steel DDR4 3600 memory. The motherboard is an MSI X570 Unify. For the graphics card, we've got an Asus ROG Strix RTX 3090. The SSD is a Samsung 970 EVO Plus. And powering all these components is an EVGA 1000 G3 power supply. Now, I don't have a very wide variety of AIOs to test this against. We're just going to be comparing it against the Corsair H159 Pro XT AIO, which is a 280mm AIO. We're first going to be testing with the fan speed set to 1000 RPM, and then we'll run the test again at full speed. As for the pump speeds, I have tested the coolers with their pump speeds at full. The Liquid Freezer 2 will run its pump speed at 100% when sending a 40% PWM signal. I don't have a sound meter, so unfortunately I couldn't do any noise normalized testing. The ambient room temperature was also maintained at 21 degrees Celsius. Alright, with all of that now out of the way, it's time we checked out the results. First, we'll take a look at our idle temperatures with the CPU coolers running their fans at 1000 RPM. And here we can see both coolers maintain average CPU temps of 29 degrees, which is to be expected. Moving on to a 30 minute stress test of Cinebench R23, here we can see the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 360 edge out the Corsair H115i by a couple degrees. It's not a huge difference, but with that said, both coolers are offering excellent performance here in this very core heavy workload. Moving on to gaming, and I've chosen Shadow of the Tomb Raider as my test title, as this game does saturate many threads and can be quite CPU intensive. Here we're looking at a slight win for the Corsair H159i, though it's really only by a single degree, and that falls within margin of error. So with the fan speed set to 1000 RPM, both the coolers ran very quiet. The Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 360 especially ran very quiet, it was practically inaudible. The Corsair H115i was also pretty quiet as well, but there was a bit of pump whine or noise, and this is because the Corsair can run its pump at 2800 RPM, whereas the Arctic maxes out at 2000 RPM. But it's also not just pump speed that uh, you have to take into account. Stuff like materials, the way the propellers are designed, the way the pump's designed, etc. All of that needs to be taken into account and contribute to noise. Moving on to our test with the coolers running at max fan speed, and keep in mind the Corsair runs its 140mm fans at a higher RPM when set to 100%, which is 2000 RPM, whereas the Arctic LF2 360 maxes out its fans at 1800 RPM. At idle, we're pretty much seeing similar attempts. The Corsair has come down a degree, and the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 360 is a 2 degrees cooler. Then in Cinebench R23, we see both coolers at basically neck and neck at 75 degrees Celsius, which, don't get me wrong, those are some very low temps for a CPU heavy task like this, but I was expecting a bit more cooling performance considering the drastic increase in fan speed from both coolers. It just goes to show you that performance does not scale linearly with the increase in fan speed, and you do get to a point of diminishing returns. Lastly, in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we again see the same results from both of these CPU coolers, although when compared to our previous results, the Corsair lowered its temps by 4 degrees, whereas the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 has gone down by 5 degrees. After seeing these results, I must say that the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 360 does a pretty good job at keeping our R7 5800X cool. I was expecting it to beat out the Corsair by a few more degrees, but I believe the reason why the H159i was able to keep up so well was because it has larger fans and can be run at higher speeds, with the pump also running significantly faster as well. Keep in mind though that even though it wasn't that much better than the Corsair H159i Pro XT, the Corsair at full speed was obnoxiously loud, and I would not recommend running the AI like this and would recommend a more conservative fan speed like 1000 RPM. The Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 360 on the other hand performed much quieter at full speed and I was quite astonished by that. There was noise but it was very tolerable to the point where I'd say you could keep it running at 100% fan speed and be totally fine. In fact my EVGA 1000 G3 power supply when it would kick on its fan was louder than the LF2 360 at full speed. So well done Arctic. These are by far the most quietest and efficient fans I have ever worked with.
One of the last things I wanted to take a look at was how beneficial it was to have the VRM fan. And well, we can see the, during the duration of our Cinebench R23 test, the VRMs ran considerably cooler than when we ran the test with the Corsair AIO. While it's better, it's not a huge necessity. These VRMs can sustain operating temps much higher under load and neither of these results were even remotely close to that point of concern or where throttling would occur. To be fair though, the MSI X570 Unify does have pretty large heatsink fans, so in scenarios where the user's motherboard doesn't have a good heatsink or just just poor ventilation or airflow, the VRM fan could help a lot. If you're in the market for a good, quiet, and now attractive all-in-one liquid cooler, you definitely can't go wrong with Arctic's Liquid Freezer 2 360 RGB. If your case has the space to accommodate it, I would highly recommend picking one up, especially if you've got a Ryzen 3000 or 5000 series CPU, and you want to really let the CPU stretch its legs by turning on features like PBO2 and Curve Optimizer. Right now you can find the ARGB version of this cooler on Amazon for as low as 122 bucks, which is a really great price for a 360mm AIO that offers great performance. I'll have a link to it down in the video description to where you can pick one up. And if you're interested in checking out other products from Arctic, I'll have a link to their site as well. If you guys found this video to be informative and entertaining, then leave a like. Let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Be sure to check out the video description for cool links and ways to support the channel, such as using my Amazon affiliate link. And if you're interested in seeing more content like this, then consider subscribing, I'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for watching, take care and I'll see you in the next one.